All right, let's, so welcome to, so you want to game program the Atari 2600. Um, I think, honestly, the real title is, so you don't want to program the Atari 2600 because at the end of this, I think you'll see what a remarkable challenge it is. If you're attracted to that kind of challenge, then it's great, but it's really unique as a console in terms of how difficult and odd it is to work with. Um, that's why I'm interested in it. Um, oh, here are all the notes um, that I've completed. Uh, so my name is Matt Christensen. I run a software development group building e-learning for my job. Um, game programming is just a hobby of mine. Um, I've, I've fallen down a 8-bit computing console rattle, starting with Atari. Currently, I'm learning like Verilog and stuff to build like FBG, FGPA stuff, and I have a long-running fascination with um, Infocom games and building. Uh, I just keep rebuilding uh, Z, like Infocom game interpreters in various languages. Uh, my first computer was an Apple II Plus. I learned AppleSoft. We grew up in Kenya, so I grew up in a world where I really didn't have anything but the books and the computer I had, so banging my head against 8-bit computers was a big chunk of my childhood. And I am not an expert. There are people here who clearly are experts. I'm just a hobbyist. This is stuff I've learned stuff I've explored. I can't show you an incredible Atari 2600 game I've made because I haven't. Um, it's just been an interesting journey. Um, so what we're going to work through today, and um, organizers let me know when I'm like 10 minutes to the end of time, um, or just give me a sign because I have no idea how long this will go. Um, so this is going to be a live workshop where we're going to build a 2600, Atari 2600 program that shows this online IDE called the 8-Bit Workshop IDE that actually supports a bunch of classic consoles and computers. You're going to learn assembly language. You're going to learn about um, background colors, play fields, and sprites. You're going to learn about reading the joystick, and you're going to learn about playing sounds. There's a handful of features of the 2600 you won't learn um, in this project because my goal for this workshop was to keep it as simple as possible. Um, if there was a better way of doing things, I'd do the worst way. If it was easier, if there was a simpler way of doing things, like I'm trying to avoid using 15 different jump commands just to use the ones we've learned again and again. So you have some, you come out of here with a sense of understanding it instead of being completely overwhelmed. Um, some of you may know assembly, some of you may not program at all. So I have no idea how much sense this will make. Um, I think what I do love about assembly language and 8-bit computers is much more so than modern machines, they're just machines. When you, If you just pay attention and learn this stuff, it's like you're pulling levers on this thing. It's not magic. It's kind of incredible just to realize that it is this machine that you can manipulate um, in such a simple way and what you can get out of it. And that's, I think, the most interesting thing. We spend this world where we're so far away. You build something in Unity, and you're so far away from what's happening. When you build something on a 2600, you're understanding how the video signal is coming out to draw your picture. Like it's just a completely different world. Um, so this is this is not a this is not a joke. If anyone here has seizure disorder or something, please let me know and just be aware that when you're fiddling with the console, the virtual console, it'll be blinky, it'll be stroby. Um, that's just because you're fiddling with this stuff. So if, if you have a seizure disorder, just please be careful. Um, so very brief history of um, the 2600 and consoles. Um, so this video isn't going to play, but the Magnavox Odyssey came out in 1972, and basically all it could do was draw three squares on a screen. Um, they couldn't collide. You put uh, actual physical um, overlays, plastic overlays on your screen. So the skiing game, you put an overlay up a ski slope on your computer and you moved the squares around and if they went out of bounds, there's nothing, no score, no nothing. What's interesting about this are two things. One, it was all analog. There are no, they didn't use any integrated circuits or anything. It was all analog circuitry. And two, this inspired a lot of the future things. In fact, what it really inspired was Pong. Um, first of all, the classic arcade cabinet. If you ever go to the Strong Museum, they have a classic Pong cabinet there. Atari made, and then eventually they were making all these, this will be familiar to modern game developers, um, the market was flooded with all these cheap home knockoffs of Pong, so Atari was contracted by Sears to build a home Pong game. Um, they sold like 150,000 of these things the first 
Christmas, um, and they cost $100 each. That's like $440 now. Um, a little known follow-up console is the Fairchild Channel F, and this is notable because this is the first console to take uh, a cartridge. The uh, Magnavox Odyssey, you played the game, the games it came with, Pong, I mean, you played Pong, like there were like variants of it like you had on the 2600 here, but it's just Pong. Uh, this you can actually change cartridges for it. It wasn't super successful. I mean, it cost $170. They sold like 250,000 uh, $250, by the time they discontinued it. I don't actually know why it wasn't successful, um, but it never really went anywhere. But then we ended up with the beautiful Atari 2600. This is one of the three major versions. There's one they also call the Darth Vader edition, and then there's like a skinnier one that they made as well. So 2600 was released in 1977 for $200 at the time. It came with nine games. It was like kind of a success at the beginning, um, but not a wild success. It became a wild success in 1980 when they released Space Invaders. Sold two million copies. They hit two billion in revenue. By 1982, they sold 10 million consoles. And I mean, this—I mean that—I mean that's a big number by now. But this was an entire market that didn't exist, and they sold 10 million of these things. They were just printing money left and right. They sold seven million of Pac-Man, which is one of the worst ports in history. You can play it here if you want. It's just garbage. Um, speaking of garbage, then in 1983, you had the video game crash where all of these consoles, and this happened to a lot of 8-bit computers too, the whole market just cratered um, all because they were so oversold. Um, and the, you know, the classic thing is the ET cartridges being buried in a dump. Um, by the time it was discontinued in 1992, it had sold 30 million, which is my spelling of million, um, copies, which is really remarkable for such a classic and simple product. And when I say simple, all right, so they had the MOS 6507. It didn't even have the 6502, which is a classic chip, you know, in the NES, the Apple IIs, um, the C64s. They wanted to save money, so they used the 6507, the, the 6507, which had a smaller address bus, so it was like slightly cheaper to make. It had 128 bytes of RAM. 128 bytes, that's it. The cartridges, because on top of using the smaller address bus for the 6507, they also, to save money, used a simpler cartridge interface. So the, the default cartridges only hold four kilobytes. So, I mean, again, just a tiny amount of stuff. There's tricks that people use to get more space on the cartridges. Um, the NTA, NTSC version had 128 colors, 60 frames per second. So modern gamers, you could appreciate this thing performed, Cure 60. There's literally no other way, other frame rate you can get out of it. Um, with 160 by 192 resolution. The main thing, and the real key to the Atari 600, 2600 success, which is kind of a bit like the success of the C64 and even the Amiga, is they had this custom chip called the telephone, the, not telephone, the television interface adapter, the TIA. And this was the special chip that let them do all this stuff for so cheap because you know 200 is like $800 now. But by the time, but at this time, this was just a remarkable thing to be able to have at a home for that price. I mean, an Apple II, our Apple II Plus was like four grand or something in 1990, in 1982. Like these things were ridiculously expensive and they seemed cheap. This thing was something that you could get for Christmas and it was not ridiculous. I mean, it's a relative price of like an Oculus or something, right? Or I guess those are cheaper now, Vive, whatever the new Vive is, the index. Um, so again, this is a workshop and if you wanna go along, what you're gonna to wanna to do is go to um, 8bitworkshop.com, which is this, work, this website here. And the code is all in my GitHub repo. Um, I have a shortcut here, uh, git.io fj capital G L F. Um, this has all the starter exercises and the completed exercises. I'm gonna work through them here too, but you can go and, um, it doesn't have a license on it right now, so I guess don't I do whatever you want. Um, so let's roll the dice and see if this pops up. Okay. 
So we're going to start with a really exciting exercise, and I'll let people get there, but we're going to start with what I'm calling Bill's Blue Background. So what you're going to want to do is open up 8bitworkshop.com, and then you're going to go to your platform and select Atari 2600 slash VCS, which stands for Video Computer System, if anyone cares. Um, then you're going to go and do New Project, and I would call it Workshop, call it whatever you want. And you're then going to want to copy the code from exercise zero in, a, in my exercises directory here. I'm just going to take that, copy it all over. And so let me I'll do it from here project. And I'm going to select this and paste it in. And if it all goes well, you're going to see a completely black screen over on the right. Um, I'll give people a second. Also, I am a software developer. I've been doing it for a very long time, and I've been known to go way too fast. So if any of these steps is too much, please let me know. Do you yes. have to set this up, or when you just go to that internet site, are you going to be able to see this right away? Yeah. That you set up? That's what's great. Is I'm actually using the template they come with. So this is all. I started with this wonderful book. It's also available on Kindle called The Making Games for Atari 2600. I don't know if he owns this site or just works on it, but this site has all the stuff. And the main Atari development guide, um, if you look in the repo, there are links to all these things. It's called Stella. It's a, it's a remake of the original Atari. Um, it, this whole product was called Stella. There's also an emulator called Stella. Um, but that's all there, and you can just go and mess around with it, which is what's so great. Can you put your Yes. And, and if you are interested in this stuff and do enjoy building this, you're going to probably eventually move from this to uh, an actual emulator plus something like uh, DASM, because then you can actually get a real debugger and tool chains and all the kind of stuff you want. This this is easy, but can be very frustrating. Yes? You pasted the exercise zero file into the browser, but you do erase all the stuff that's in there? Yeah, you can erase all the stuff that's in there. You can just unwind one, pasting all the stuff. Yep, just copy and paste it out. It's basically the same thing. I just have, so I mean, and we'll get to this in a sec. Um, the, the default stuff has some macros in it that make the tooling a little easier. Um, but part of the goal of this workshop is to learn everything from the basics so you can use the macros and the advanced stuff knowing how it works. There's actually something called Atari Basic, which despite the name is a compiler for Atari that you can use to build things more simply. However, you'll see the nature of the 2600 means if you don't understand how it works at the assembly level, you're going to be banging your head against the wall constantly otherwise. Um, all right, any other questions or any, anyone need a little more time? Can you put the slide there for you? Yep. Oh, that's good. I think we'll help you out. Oh, this one? And of course, this website does have complete root access to your drive, so if you, you know, you'll just format it if you do anything wrong. Yeah. This is an Atari, it's all root. Yep, so you will go over to. So go over to the exercise zero. Um, the way I have it set up is exercises has the templates that you start with, and then you complete it as the completed version of each exercise that you can copy over um, when you're done. For while well, people are just getting set up, you can basically ignore 
all of this stuff. I mean, well, you can't ignore it at all. If you break, if you remove any of it, it's going to break. But almost all of this is really just configuration to set up your virtual car. Because what you're doing here is it's not like it's not a compiler. It's not even a you know, it's not even it's not an interpreter. You're, you're, you're specifying, you're essentially speci specifying the exact bytes that are going out to your virtual cartridge here that gets loaded into your emulator over here on the right. So you can see at the top, it's saying we're doing a 6502. I know it said it was 6507. They're exactly the same processor, except one is cheaper. Um, you can see some start stuff. You can see that org is just saying where to put the code on the cart. Um, this, this SEI is kind of interesting because every cart has it and no one really knows why. It's kind of like a superstition. It's, it's, it's calling an interrupt that the chip doesn't even have, but like everyone leaves it on. Um, all right, so let's get, if you're there, let's get started with this incredibly exciting thing. So you'll see in your code, there's a place, insert your code below this and above this. So what you're gonna type is LDA Octafork dollar sign eight zero and then STA the capitals are important C O L U B K and so I'll show what that's like LDA pound dollar eighty star And there we go, the exact shade of bills. I don't know, I'm basically colorblind. And so once you have that in place, you can experiment with a couple things. Try changing the number. And also for bonus points, see what happens if you remove the dollar sign. We'll get back to that later. Anyone want me to walk, come around? Everyone. <clears throat> Congrats, you're all assembly language programmers now. <laughs> yes? Oh, because I'm just messing around with the number here, because look what happens as I change that number. <laughs> Well, I can remove the zero too. And I'll show that in a second. Is the COLUBK uh, an address that's some hardware address for the yeah. chip? Yeah, it's not something in the processor, it's something for the yeah. Correct. Correct. Right. Um, so, and again, if I'm going too fast, just put up your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, Mm -hmm. Does that book that you have have what all those addresses are equal to? Yeah, and actually if you Google VCS.h, it has all the addresses. Um, so let's just quickly talk through a couple things here. So I can't avoid this. There's no way to do assembly language without talking about binary, decimal, and hex. Um, I taught my 10-year-old daughter to add binary and work with binary this weekend at the diner, so it's something that's within everyone's capacity. This is also something that can seem really imposing if you're not used to it, but if you start working with assembler, um, or even at the end of this I have some games, but it's Zactronics, this company, that are basically all assembly language programming, you'll get used to this. But, so, in the assembly language we're using for 6502, a dollar sign is just a decimal number. I'm sorry, a pound sign, a pocket door, just a normal number, so 129. If you add a dollar sign in front of the pocket door, that turns it into a hexadecimal number. And hexadecimal number is base 16. So what that means is, in this case, 81 is actually 8 sixteens and 1 1. 8 times 16 plus 1, which is the same as 129. And in binary, that's one zero 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 one. One one hundred one one hundred twenty eight zero sixty four zero thirty two zero sixteen zero eight zero four zero twos and one one. So the reason we use hexadecimal is because it has this nice little feature that when you'll notice these this is grouped in in A here. Um, on, on most six oh and six five oh twos it's called eight bit hardware, which is probably a term you've heard of. 
And part of that is that the unit you use is a byte of eight bits. Um, and each byte splits into two nibbles. Seriously, that's what it's called, of four binary digits. And four binary digits is one hexadecimal digit. And the thing is, when you're working in assembly language, you're using these things. So when I see eight, I know that that's actually one zero 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 one. These are patterns. When we build sprites in a second, you're building those potentially from these numbers. You don't, you know, you can use decimal numbers for this whole thing. As you get deep into this, you do have to start understanding how to convert things. I mean, Google will do it for you. But that's what's sort of interesting about, and if you see hexadecimal, the other one you'll see sometimes is octal, which is base eight, that like older computers tend to choose more. Um, all right, so with your amazing blue here, so here's the first thing about the Atari 2600. They could not afford a frame buffer. It, you know, if you don't know what that means, what that means is, remember I said it had 128 bytes of RAM? To have multicolor, a multicolor screen by, that's um, like a typical three, 320 by 200 pixel display requires 8,000 bytes, which would have cost thousands of dollars in memory. So the way they save money is by having no frame buffer at all. When you draw with the 2600, you set values in the memory that that chip I mentioned called the TIA converts right into video signals. There is literally no way to put pixels on the screen. Pixels don't even exist. They're called color clocks. So what you did here is you did two things. LDA stands for load to accumulator, okay? If you've ever done other programming, you're used to just pushing variables around wherever you want. But when you're dealing in assembly at the machine language level, um, and, and side note, assembly and machine language are basically the same thing. Assembly is just a way of making the machine language understandable. Every single thing you're typing here goes right to one of those binary strings, one of those 100001. The thing gets put into the chip and directs it directly. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. There's nothing in between. It's not even like modern C, where all sorts of stuff are happening when you're compiling it. It's literally going in and telling it to do exactly. So part of what's weird is the 6502 chip has what are called um, registers on it, which are kind of super fast memory that it uses to work with things. So what LDA says load to accumulator. So what you did when you typed LDA, you loaded the number hex 80 into this accumulator, register A it's called. STA stands for store accumulator value that takes what's in the accumulator and puts it to a memory address. And like you mentioned, that CLUBK is actually just a shortcut to one of these memory addresses that's in the TIA register space. And those are all mapped directly onto hardware. They're not like RAM. There is a space that when you set it, the hardware sets the background color right then and there. We'll show that in a second. So let's see what that means in practice. Um, so what we're going to do next is, excuse me one second. Um, so next up, let's copy exercise one. Over into our ID, and you can just right go right over what you did before. And now we're going to try something that's very similar to what we did before, but a little different. We're going to type STX, call UBK, and then DEX. And I think at this point we're already dividing into the people who think this is amazing and just love all these things and think this is the worst thing they've ever seen. Um, again, half of this talk is so you don't ever want to build an Atari 2600 game again. You should play those electronic games, though. They're great. Um, so I'm going to do that over here. STX, call you BK, DEX. And this is where the seizure warning comes in. So what's happening here? Well, it's making pretty colors. Remember I mentioned there was an A register on the chip? There's two other registers called X and Y. 
Um, and X and Y are you, the A register is your kind of like fancy mega register you use for real math. The X and Y are used for lookups. So in this case, DEX stands for decrement X register. So that just takes what's in X down by one. So X will have actually started at zero. It's gonna move X to the background color. It's then, it's gonna subtract it, subtract one from it. And if you see that JMP next frame, that's a jump. It's pretty much what it sounds like. It means we're gonna go, the, the program execution is gonna go STX call UPK, DEX, jump next frame. And then it's gonna jump up to where next frame is. And then it's gonna move down to, do, so this is, right now, our emulator is just infinitely looping here. Um, these mnemonics here, these addresses, these aren't, these aren't real, these don't go out to the computer. This just gets replaced by a memory address in the assembler. So, it's pretty, it's not much of a game. So let's talk about, let's do one more thing and then we'll talk about how that worked. So you don't really have to recopy because all you're gonna do now is right after where it says DEX, type STAWSYNC, capital W-S-Y-N-K. So if I do that, so what happened? And want to explain the difference? Scheduling and vertical sync. Yes. Uh, you, you knew the answer. But yes, that's exactly what's happening. Um, and again, you can see the seizure warning thing. Let's let's talk about what's going on here. And okay, this is probably the most complicated thing I'm going to show you today. So, going to how the Atari 2600 works. There is a, a book I'm recommending called Racing the Beam. And when you program the Atari 2600, what you're doing is racing the beam. And the beam in this case is the electron gun in your CRT. This, this doesn't, I had to buy this stupid little CRT because it will not work with an LCD. It won't even work with like some modern CRTs. Atari 2600 video signal is coming out here and it is, you know, if you don't know how CRT works, there's a phosphor screen, there's phosphorus here, there's sets of magnets, there's a gun shooting electron, you know, electron gun shooting electrons, and that gun, that beam, what it's doing is it's going from one side of the screen to the other, then it goes back down, keeps going like that. So it's drawing the, the pixels, scanning like that. And that's called a raster. Um, so in the NTSC format, you have a total of, bless you, it's like 262.5. Don't ask about the 0.5. It's actually really interesting. You can Google it, but it's not relevant for you. So what happens is when you're going through a main loop in the Atari 2600, first of all, you need to spit out three lines of vertical sync. And that's just a special signal that tells the TV you need to be at the top again, and it gives it some time to recover and move. Because again, what's interesting about the physicality here, that beam has to move, the magnets have to change. Like things are in flux in the TV, there's an actual time change to move it up there. Now we have 30 lines of vertical blank. And this is, this is your bread and butter. This is 30 glorious lines where you can do code. Now we get to the picture. You have this period of time called horizontal blank. Remember I said how the beam had to go to one side and come back to the other? That horizontal blank is the time the beam is returning to the other side and it's not drawing. So you have time to do things in that period of time. And then at the bottom, you have overscan, where again, you've turned the beam off. So this is very different than if you've ever done any kind of programming. This is very, well, I don't know, there's other kind of programming like this, but you're constantly racing the beam to get your code in. If you're trying to change things, you're trying to change the picture on every line, you have to do it before the beam starts drawing again, or it's just gonna start drawing. And every, color clock, if you remember that, if you remember the second exercise where there are those weird blocks of uh, things, um, the Target 2600 doesn't really do pixels, it does these things called color clocks. 
Um, each color clock takes um, three cycles. A cycle is a pass through the CPU. And if you look at your, you look at the side of your, um, sorry, I got to get my PowerPoint stopped here. You look at the side here, those things are your cycle counts. So it takes three cycles to store that value in X. It takes two cycles to decrement. It takes another three cycles to do this. And then it takes another three cycles to jump. 15 pixels have been drawn by the time you can just store a variable in your accumulator. And what that means is you really only have like 20 cycles or so in those in-between times to do any work. So not only did it, like I said, you have no frame buffer, you only have 128 bytes of RAM. And all your work has to be done keyed to these drawing cycles. So spinning back, what's happening when you're doing style one sync, W sync? That stands for wait for sync. So that's a special register that if you, it's called strobing the register. If you strobe that register, it just means you write to it. It doesn't matter what it is. The CPU pauses and it waits until it gets to the other vertical blank screen. So what happened when, when I'm in here, what we're actually seeing, if you look at those lengths, that's just the length of time it takes the CPU to decrement and then draw. Those are each 15 pixels wide. And they're going off the edge of the screen because we're not caring about any of that stuff. When I add in the style was sync, now we're lining up to the actual lines. OK, but obviously we want something that's less stroby than this. Um, any questions about? Uh, it's a lot to absorb, and I'm not pretending you fully get it. But any questions about this particular? When it's doing that state, that wait for sync, is it actually pausing the processor? Yeah. That's what I thought. That's, and, and that's the thing is you don't have to do that. If you time it right, you can use up all your cycles. It's not, it's not a mandatory thing. Yeah. All right, so let's try and just do a nice smooth. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The limitations on the um, time, is that the television or the console? It's a console. Or the combination of both? It's just literally the chip isn't fast enough. So it can it, it can only get a cycle in for every one. And, and I mean, the main thing is, like I said, to meet the NTCSC signal, it has to put out those 60 frames. It, it, the TIA chip has to issue things at that rate. One of the weird things, that means if you have a PAL Atari, that's a 50 cycle machine. It works differently. It doesn't have as many cycles on it. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's just the CPU. It's just, just can't go any faster to match the, the code. So yeah. did, the, did the developers have to complete their fever code bases, or they kind of just modify for PAL or MTSC? That I, that's a great question. I actually don't know. I don't know how much change you have to make. I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of curious if you actually have. And the CPU is going to be the same speed. So I'm, get, you know, I'm guessing that you. Time. You have more time in some places and less in others, mm -hmm. and the colors are different. So I mean, that's a good thing. Um, you can find various home reports. Like uh, I have a little card here that I'll show later. Uh, this Harmony card at the end, that's actually got an FGPA or something in it, and it takes SD cards. Um, and you can put your own code on it. So we'll have everything built is on that if you want to play with it. Um, but they have PAL, they have some interesting PAL ports and other things. I know like there's other games where the PAL difference makes a big difference, like fighting games. Like what was that it was that console that they just made? They ported like Capcom or something, ported like a bad version because it was PAL and like slower. Um, nothing to do with this. Um, okay, let's get some Can you oh. better that, that no. thing? Well, uh, that's a great question. You, you can't I mean, you probably could, but if you did, now everything goes out of sync. Because this is all wired up. They're, they're, everything is completely meshed with how things work. If it went faster, now you're going to get out of sync. And in fact, one of the weird things about developing the 2600 is when you make mistakes, they show up visually. You'll, just, you'll, you'll realize you're out of space on a line because there's just a big black blob that's now taken over your part of the screen. Um, so I think you could. I don't know what would happen. It would probably all go haywire. Um, so
So what we're going to do now is copy over exercise three. And we're back to a beautiful black screen. I'll also say, I mean, you know, Chris, you were saying how you know, the game space is about art and music and all these other things. Well, one of the things about the 2600 is it's kind of a programming machine because the art, you can't really get, you can kind of get some stuff. The, the music, it doesn't, it, the tones aren't, the tones are like harmonic. They're not even in, they're not even like major scale tones. They're just like all multiples of each other. It's really difficult to get anything great out of it that's not kind of a homebrew thing. So in that sense, it's kind of an anachronism. Like it doesn't matter how good an art you were, artist you are if you only have that level of pixels and you can't even, you don't even have bit by bit drawing. Um, all right, so let's just talk through this quickly. Um, so now, though there are several steps through this workshop where you, you have to actually add some more complicated stuff and there's no way around it. Um, so remember we already had this very short loop where we went from next frame, did a couple things, jump back to next frame. Next frame is still all the way up there, so that's no different. So what's happening here? Um, well, so first of all, we're loading the value to the accumulator and storing it to this um, register V blank. This is a special register that will turn off the beam. So if you put, number, if you put the number two in the register, it will turn off the, the beam. And again, you can turn it on or off whenever you want. It doesn't have to match the cycle. You could just turn the whole thing off the whole time if you want. Then you do these um, stop vsync. That tells it to start sending the vertical sync signal. And again, going to how this is different, it's literally just saying, yeah, send that synchronization signal out of your chip. Um, and then the three Sawa syncs, you know what those do? What do those do? And remember? Wait for, yeah, wait for a line. So just think of it next line, next line, next line. Think of it almost like a character term. Um, and then we turn off the vsync. This stuff at the top is just boilerplate. You've got to do it. If you actually start playing around with this IDE, they have macros that do it all for you. So it's not like you have to worry about it. Um, here you see some great coding style where I have a difference here between 36 and 37. 37. This is just wasting time because to do the stuff we want to do, we have to get to our drawing. So what this is doing is it's loading 37 into X. It's waiting a line, it's decrementing, and B and E, V blank loop. So what this is going to do is it's going to run through X starting at 37 down to zero and loop until it's done. So it's 37 lines. What's B and E? Well, it stands for branch not equal. Um, you know, if you're, again, if you've used higher level programming languages, you're used to exciting things like being able to say, well, if A equals B, do C? Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, in assembly, in 6502 assembly, you have all these, these flags, these three or four flags that get set by various operations. And these will all jump based on the value of those flags. But you can learn patterns. And in this case, if you use this kind of load X, dex, DNE, this will loop until zero is hit. So this is looping 37 lines. OK. So this is where our code is going to go. We'll come back to that in a second. Yeah, go ahead. What's the end stand for? Again, the beginning. Branch not equal? Not equal. Not, not. Yeah, in, in, a, in assembler, all of the, you, you can do equality not equal checks, but you actually, it does a subtraction first. We'll see that a little later on. Uh, but it's actually a subtract, and then whether you end up at zero or not. So once it gets to zero, it just spawns through. We'll yeah, exactly. So now we turn the beam back on, because now we want to start drawing. Now we draw 192 lines, but well, we're not drawing anything because the buffers are all empty. But <laughs> it's going. And then we get to our overscan, we turn off the beam again and do that. So this is, this is our main loop. This is the main loop of any Atari 2600 game. Um, so what we're going to do now is, oh, okay. this is just me walking through what I just walked you through. Okay.
All right, here we go. So, you can see my pre-warning here. So in the area that says, insert your code here, DEY, anyone want to speculate on what DEY does? That commands the, the Y register. So now you've met all of the 6502's registers, A, X, and Y. Um, side note, technically a register is any memory address. In this case, these are the CPU registers, but again, they are very key. So STY, we've met STA and STX. What do you think STY does? Stores to Y. And then stop or sync. It's our old next line. And if we do that, now we have a beautiful pulsing color. Um, if you're astute, you'll notice that it doesn't really seem to be going through any kind of same set of colors, even though what we were doing is an infinite loop from 0 to 255. The Atari colors because, of course, they are. They're not like nice and sequential. They're kind of all over the place. All right. So let's, let's slow things down a bit. Um, exercise four. <clears throat> so, all right. So let's take exercise four. And Chris, what time do you want me to go to? I don't know. I made way too much of this, so I'm going to have to end early. So I can go. I can keep going until people are done. Just let me know. There's time for people to talk after. Okay. 8.30? Okay. So what I'm going to do then is show a couple more things and then just jump to the last thing where you can see um, what we would be building um, if I had judged the time more accurately. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll do this um, exercise four here. That's a few more things. So paste, excuse me, paste that in. I hate the track pedal on this thing so much. All right, so once you have that pasted in, this one is, we're going to get to some exciting stuff, and we're actually going to use some variables. It's worth noting, a variable in assembly is just the memory address. It's just one of those 128 bytes of RAM. So you can just use them directly. With assembler, however, we can conveniently um, use the mnemonics. So what you're going to do is, in, way at the top, right below org 80, you can add those two things, which are just saying allocate a byte for, back, for what we're calling background color and a byte for what we call cycle speed. Those are just our names. They don't mean anything in it themselves. You can also allocate words, which are two bytes. You can allocate arrays, like you can allocate an array of n things. Um, you can't allocate less than a byte, but it's real easy in assembly language to work all the way down to bits. Is it just use the maximum value? Yeah. And in fact, so we see org dollar sign 80. That's just saying, OK, this part of the ROM um, started at 80, and that's actually where the RAM starts. So if you open up, if you download St the Stella, if you, if you get into this, and you'll see it. You download the Stella emulator, because it has a debugger built in. You'll see your variables push through um, there. So let's do that. So it doesn't really do anything. We have those two. Next up, well, we need to initialize our variables. Um, so the next insert your code below this, you'll see is in this area here. And I'll switch back to the code. This is just stuff that is being run before our first main loop starts, so we're just putting initialization stuff. You can kind of put it wherever. Remember when we get in our main loop, that's running every time. So we're going to put um, this stuff in here, which if I reduce, all right. 
right, so we will do both these. So LDA 10, star cycle speed, Tay. Um, that starts playing a Taylor Swift sample. It's, it's weird. Um, LDA 40, star background color. So let's do that. LDA, LDA 10. Cycle speed, Tay, this tap doesn't do anything. LDA 40, star background color. All right, and I think so far, if you type this in, you can probably figure out what it's doing. Anyone want to explain? Take a crack at it. Yep. 10 goes in cycle speed. So Tay, that's a bit weird. That's a new one. That stands for transfer accumulator to Y. And basically, we're going to be using that cycle speed later. So this is just initializing this main variable and also just dumping it in Y so we can use it later. Then we're loading 40 into the background color. And so finally, we're going to do, we're going to go down to this next bit here. Insert your code here, and we're going to be typing this in. DEY, our old friend DNE, skip decrement color, LDY background color, DEY, STY background color, LDY cycle speed. When you type skip decrement color, it does have to be left justified or it won't work. That's how it knows, that's how the assembler knows it's a label and not a variable. So that is important. And what this is going to do, it's going to decrement y. If y is hit 0, it'll jump to the skip decrement color, which you can see loads the background color from our variable and then puts that as the background color. Then we're going to decrement y. If it's not, it's going to decrement y again and basically cycle through. So what this is going to do is essentially wait cycle speed cycles before it changes the background color again. So it's going to do the exact same cycle we did last time, but slowed down by a step of 10. I think one thing that becomes real apparent is how tedious assembly language can be. There's a reason people move to compiled languages. Like you have to do everything by hand, like this basic kind of for loop you're having to do bit by bit and remembering which of your various variables you're keeping track of. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to loop over multiple things and you're using y and x, and now you want to use something else, well, now you have to temporarily put your y and your x in some memory location um, so you can use them for something else, pull it back out. Now you're burning cycles left and right, and you just run out of time on your line. Um, so I'm going to type this in, dy, skip back. I'll do the faster thing and just copy it over from the completed version. All right. So that's what it'll end up looking like. And what you'll see if we go up and change the initial background color, we can cycle through here. And if we change the cycle speed, we can make it go faster or slower. So all this time, and all you can do is change the background color and cycle the colors. Um, so in my 10 minutes, I'm now going to sort of accelerate. You can um, do all this at home. I'll put the deck somewhere. And if you're curious, you can sort of run through. I mean, there's all sorts of ways you could learn. But I kind of set this up to take you through step by step the various bits and pieces. Um, let's go, let's switch over to, does anyone have questions about this last exercise? All right, so let's go to five here. So this is real exciting. You see two blue bars. 
So other than the background color, one of the things you can tell the chip to draw is what's called the play field. And the play field is a set of optionally reflected thick, I think they're like 30 pixel wide variables that you set by setting ones and zeros basically in your, in this accumulator here. So you have three of these play field things. And if you just, so if I put FF, which is just one, 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 that's just it's gonna draw a line straight across. And like all things, what I'm having to do here, and this is going to racing the beam, what I'm doing here is setting the colors, then waiting 10, and that's how I'm drawing a line, 10 picks, you know, 10 of these things thick, then I'm turning it off again. So that's basically how you're using play fields to draw. You're turning it on and off. If we go to six, now even more excitingly, we have a side here too. And if you look at the side play field, um, that's this one here. We set zero for PF1 and two, so that's the black areas. And then we set this one to 10. And if I change that value here, you'll see how that changes out and kind of moves to make things thicker and not thicker. So the play field is actually, even though it's just meant for the play field, and I'll show a screenshot of combat in a second, but the Atari 2600 was basically made to build play Pong and combat and a couple of these other games. Everything else that came out of it was basically smart programmers figuring out weird ways to change things. So now, now we have to Atari 2600 does have sprites. It has two sprites. They're each one pixel thick and eight pixels wide. So that's your sprite. You can make an eight pixel sprite that's one thick. So for instance, what I did here is um, to draw the sprite here. Um, that's this GRP0. I load AA, which is 1010, and look, so the 1010 draws dot, 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 and then I turn it on and off, and that's how it goes. Like, yeah, what? When you say, like, those are your two sprites, like, are those, like, the only two sprites that every single game can use? Ever? No, well, I mean, every game, you have two sprite registers. So you have sprites, you can position them, um, you can position them by, I'll, I'll sort of show that in a sec. You, you position them by flagging or by strobing a register when your cycles fit a certain point. So you don't say draw sprite X at Y. You wait until you want the sprite to be drawn horizontally. Then you strobe a register and now it's gonna start drawing it on there. And then you can change that register to any one of the zero to 255 values. So when I change this to AAA, that's dot, 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 dot. And so while my sprite is being drawn here, it goes like that. If I go in here and I'm gonna remove this second one, now my sprite goes the whole screen because it never turns off. It's just drawing infinitely. So yeah, you have the player one sprite and the player two sprite. So, so far we have background color, play field, player one sprite, player two sprite. So you've got scaling going on here, vertical scaling. It just, it, it, once this is on, it's just drawn. Just, that's. Now, you can, I was telling you, you were, oh yeah, go ahead. So, how does that work, like, say, if you're making, like, stuff like pitfall, general point stuff like that, it's like, each frame, I guess you could say, is like, turned on off of those drawn lines, yeah. pretty much. You ever seen, like, the Hellraiser movies? That's basically what developing this is like. <laughs> It's just a nightmare torture. Because what you're doing is you're using all these bits and pieces and turning them on and off to get the picture you want. That, that's the thing, it doesn't work like any, and that's what, that's why it's kind of hard to explain unless you walk through this. It doesn't work like anything you've ever done. Because there is no, like you have a sprite, but it's just this thing you can turn on and off. Now I can take that sprite and I can do something like really amazing. Like this is my rendition of the Buffalo Game Space logo. I managed to get the four buttons. Uh, two of the buttons have to be the same color because you can only have one color per sprite. Um, but yeah, so I can build that sprite. And the way you build that sprite is you load up your sprite data here. And there are tools that let you build, I linked to one, that let you build these sprites and generate this. And then you go through and you have a loop 
um, this draw sprite loop here, where you just line by line, I'm going into incrementing x and pulling in the sprite value, although I'm actually doing it backwards because going down is faster so the sprite is reversed. But so when you say the tool to build it, they just define all those points from the tool defines the points. Just, the it's a JavaScript tool, you just draw things. Yeah. Uh, did you say you have two sprites? Yes, you have a player two sprites. So the other sprite could be the other color in that. Color. Yes. Yes, exactly. But now you have to handle both of those. Um, yeah. So here, so here we have vertical movement. Um, with my little fake joystick. The, the joystick stuff is actually pretty easy. Um, all right, and I'll power through here. The joystick that stuff is pretty easy. I'm not even going to. You just you read some values and you do your stuff, and it's tedious but fine. Um, we can do. So now you can. I added a balance check so you don't go off the top. Um, just to, to talk about earlier stuff. So. We'll, I mentioned how things break very visibly. So this doesn't have a balance check. Well, look what happens when I go off the top of the screen. That's because I have a loop in there that's looping from 0 to the y value of my character. The y value of my character now is like 255 because everything is wrapped around. So now it's at the bottom, and it, it's, it's happily drawing it, but like, it, it's real wrong. Um, so here we have. Um, I'm going to do this. One. Oh, sound, yeah. So this one just made some amazing sound. Let's see if it works. I don't think the sound is coming through. Um, you can actually see when I hit the space bar, it kind of vibrates at the bottom because I have some bug in there. Um, to do horizontal motion, um, so here I added horizontal motion, but to do horizontal motion, it's actually incredibly hard because you can only, when you do your timing and you, you strobe a register to say, I want to be at this position, but that only has a resolution of like uh, 15 pixels. So you have to strobe another registration with the delta of how many pixels you want to move this thing back. So there's this, uh, this is from the book, but there's this subroutine that you basically call that does a calculation as to what the remainder should be of your movement to stroke this register to put your stupid thing just in the exact pixel position where you want. Um, and here's where it gets weirder. This thing will sometimes take exactly whatever the total number of um, cycles in the screen are. So you can't use WSync anymore because what will happen is it will skip a line when you move past a certain vertical. So what you do have to use is um, timers. The Atari comes with some timers um, that basically you can say, okay, you know, um, ping me again when this thing has looped so many times. But the timers are all like multiples of 32 and stuff, so they're a massive pain. He has macros in here to help him with that. But the point is, even something like I want this thing to be at this pixel position and it's the sprite, the thing you offer me. Um, is incredibly difficult. It does have collisions. You can check if anything on the screen collided with anything else. Um, and that's just a bit flag. It's incredibly easy. It makes no sense. Like it's the one thing that's super easy in the entire thing. Um, you do have to clear the collisions because if you forget, then everything breaks. Um, you also have two, mi two missiles and a ball, which are a single bit well, a single um, dot sprite, basically, that you can't control anything. The colors match the two players. You can turn them on and off. Um, the missiles have the one feature that you can strobe a specific register, and they'll match the, horror, the vertical positions of, um, it was designed for paddles. So you can, you, can, you can tell it to do it. But like a lot of times, those are used, like if you see lines, like sort of, rendered lines in Atari games, those are often the balls and paddles and stuff being turned on and off. Um, so the, the final thing, and I'm actually just, I'm going to put it, um, I'm going to take this off a sec if that's okay, because I think it's, it's most interesting. The final exercise here was not a game, but the simplest possible thing I could think of that was vaguely interesting that we could build in an hour which I couldn't even do that. So uh, let's do, so this is the little thing that, that 
that you just end up building. So all it's doing is we've got horizontal and vertical movement of a sprite. When you push the button, it, it, there, you have two sound channels. Like I said, the sound channels are just basically arbitrary. So you can set a couple things. You can set volume. You can set like whether it's a square wave or a sine wave or like a couple other things. Um, and then, you know, I just set it so it kind of flickered. Um, and again, this is kind of cool because this, this card, I mean, just to take it full circle and why this stuff is fun, this card is running, I mean, this is a real Atari running the code we just wrote here that you can just download from that, that web IDE, um, which is super, like, that, you don't need a, any additional tool chains to do that. You just download it, I put it on here before, and we have our little um, thing here. And just, just to finish, take a couple more minutes. Just to talk through the rest of the presentation. Um, okay, yeah, so there's a slide I didn't, didn't finish. Enumerate all the 6502 we learned. We learned some, there's a bunch more. Uh, and, and I think 6502 is weird too because, I mean, game programming is more performance, cares about performance more than most kinds of programming. But again, you can see here that saving one cycle is sometimes literally the only way you can do what you need to do. You have to have that one cycle. So using a different instruction that works slightly differently and saves you that one cycle gets you what you need. Um, so I just wanted to quickly show this because I think the most interesting thing from what you've learned is if you look at Atari games, they all have a certain look. Why do they have look? So here's, here's um, combat. What can you immediately say about how combat is built? Can anyone notice anything? Symmetrical. It's symmetrical, so it's using play field, it's using a reflected play field. You can see there's the two sprites. You, see, you know how you often have the blocky score text at the top? That's because that's just using the play field to draw that. Here's Battle Zone. So I had a slide, and maybe it's later. Like, so here are things you don't get out of Tars. If you need a random number generator, write it yourself. You want to draw a line, figure it out how to do it yourself. There's no line drawing. Um, so those lines there, remember I was talking about ball graphics. That's probably just going in and doing some math calculations. Oh, there's no floating point, remember. So good luck with that. Um, <laughs> It's just turning that on off. But again, you can notice that very characteristic <coughs> horizontal line that's the play field. Um, Pitfall, Pitfall is particularly interesting because Pitfall has 256 rooms in it, okay? The cart only has 4K. So if each room is one byte, which is, is actually basically how they do it, it has eight flags for what's in the room, you'd have used a 16th of your cart just on the data for your levels. So Pitfall is actually procedurally generated. He came up with a cyclical equation, tried a whole bunch of them with starting parameters to spit out a game that worked, and the game that worked is the one he had. So he got it down to it only takes 40 bytes. And for you, <laughs> ET. But I kind of put this there because everyone, you know, we joke about this, but I mean, beyond there being no internet, like these people, writing these games were figuring out everything from scratch. There was nothing to share. They only had these tools. They had to figure out these techniques. Um, so even bad games were incredibly hard to write. It's not like so many modern systems where you, know, you open up RG, RPG Maker, it's really easy to make an RPG. You know, in this workshop, I couldn't even make a game in the hour. Like the best I could do is get halfway to making something that blinks the screen and plays noises. Like that's it. There's no faster way to get there. Um, yeah, saving games, uh, text, you want text, you do it yourself. Maybe you use sprites, maybe you use play through. floating point, yep, yeah, nope. Um, all right, and these are, if you go to my, if you go to the repo, I have all of these tools in it. Um, but this book I really enjoy, The Making Games, Racing the Beam, by, that's, that's more a history of Atari, but it's super interesting. Um, Stella was the original code name of Atari, and you can get a web version of the probably completely legal scanned PDF version of the original developer guide, which is kind of neat because it has like hand-drawn stuff in it. Um, 
This is a useful 6502 reference where you can um, click on things and it'll sh it's, it's indexed. Um, if you want to play around, download the Stella emulator, go to atariage.com if you want to spend a lot of money buying old carts. That color chart there is useful if you want to try and do anything with colors. And that uh, alien bill thing was the, is the tool that lets you build the sprites and just copy and paste it in. Um, and finally, if you're genuinely, if, if you came out as being like, well, I don't want to work on Atari 2600, but um, assembly language is really interesting. I, I can't recommend more these three um, games by Zetronics, TS100, Shenzhen IO, and Exapunks. Um, Shenzhen IO also has a hardware component, which is, is cool, but it's a little different. Um, Exapunks, if you like cyberpunk and assembly language, you cannot go wrong with that game. I had to stop playing it because it was making me so angry. And all of these games, you're often, you have to redo solutions. Well, you can play with your friend, you, you can, there's leaderboards, and you have to re-optimize solutions for like size, cycle count, and stuff like that. Um, and TS100 is kind of like a weird fictional parallel processing thing. And they're all puzzle games, but you do have to use assembly language. So they are a great way to learn um, enough assembly language to be dangerous. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Any quick, any quick questions? I know we have to jump over. You said you're going to try to put that somewhere where we can get at that? Um, yeah, I'll put the deck, I'll figure out, I'll put the deck, I'll upload the deck to uh, the same uh, sure, GitHub the repository. Yeah, we'll build that on yeah. social media. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you could say it real quick, but what was the development process in 1977 for building a game? What kind of computer were you using? Did you get a right to the chip that you were plugging into the cartridge? Or did you have like a kind of developer kit that was basically an Atari that you had a serial port plugged in? That's a great question. I think it was often a dev kit and they often used mainframes and other things, but I don't know the specific. I know like for Infocom games, they were originally building them on like PDP 10s and stuff and porting them over. Um, that's a great question. I actually don't know what they used. Because um, that was before the PCs. Yeah. The Apple was one of the first PCs. That's how it came up before that. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and after again, um, so it's even worse. We're probably working on paper too. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to come up, well, that, actually, that's a lot of it. People did program on paper and get everything right a lot more than we do now. Um, but you also could because you could maintain the entire computer state in your head. Um, yeah, they're using like, like they're probably using like the Sinclair or the. So that's after this. This is this is seventy. Yeah, this is seventy seven. I mean. Just little, I mean, this thing was magic. Like it was 77 and you had this color computer playing all these games that if you come up and play are actually like, like Chris and I, we were like started playing combat and then all of a sudden like five minutes later we're still playing because the games are fun. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't a novel, like the previous things were novelties. This was a thing kids loved and adults loved. I mean, it was fun. Yeah, um, back then you had to go to universities to work on mainframes yeah. or defense systems that have computers. That was it. <laughs> they, the, one of the guys wrote a version of BASIC for this. I told you it had 128 bytes of RAM and he wrote a BASIC for it. I mean, it's the most useless BASIC in history, but somehow they did it. It's, and that's really the magical story. It's just how much people got out of this crazy bit of hard. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh. So, you said that NES had a similar chip to the 6502. The exact same chip. So, how are they able to use like sprites? Like, I guess because they have their own custom um, graphics chips. So back in the day, I mean, you can kind of think of this into consoles up into the latest generation. Like the PS4, you know, kind of pushed it with like the cell chip. But there was a point where, especially at this time, the custom hardware is how you got your speed because the commodity stuff was too slow. So what these early consoles realized is if you if you use the CPU and then build custom inexpensive graphics hardware, because like the NES is tile based too, it's not even sprite based itself. If you build this cheaper thing, this cheaper hardware, then you can get these incredible games off these really, because the 6502 was a genuinely inexpensive chip. It was made for um, commodity uses. Like it, like it was kind of like miraculous. That's why it was in everything. Um, the Z80 was great too, and you know the Amiga. Even up to that point, you know the reason that was so great was 
that, and sometimes they're just smart, like Steve Wozniak for the Apple II, has this whole crazy thing where the high-res mode like is backwards, so they got like one extra pixel and could have like three more colors. I mean, that, it was that era where you just squeezed every little thing out of everything you could do, and you know, the people working on this, it was it's still almost more electronics than computer programming, right? Um, and I guess my final pitch is there's a Coursera course called From Nan to Tetris I'm taking right now. Um, that you start by, you use a, a hardware emulator and you build, um, you basically build a microprocessor, a fake microprocessor from logic gates from the start and then build an assembly language. Um, and it's incredibly interesting if you like any of this stuff. It's not a lot of work, it's easy, um, but it's, you know, learning how all the bits and pieces actually connect together is super important for this early stuff. So you do understand, you know, how much it matters. Basically, to think of the chip like the TIA or the answer, this is the graphics card. It's just like your CPU can't keep up, or your Bitcoin mining can't keep up with like without the graphics card for doing all these like special like processing. And what's that course called again? From NAND to Tetris. I mean, I will leave this up here so after this, anyone wants to come up if they want to play around with any of the games or see the stuff or ask me more. But all right, I'm done. Thank you. Cool. Very cool.